Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University. Welcome to Outrider 45, how to prepare for a PhD program. What a brilliant suggestion. And this suggestion comes from the legendary Akbar. Akbar's been a great new colleague that I've met in the last year or so. And Akbar gave me this request, and I'll read it to you, it's a great one. Quote, to be proactive, what can I do effectively before coming into a PhD program? I kind of want to save my future eye. End of quote. Brilliant. Now, what a great request, because this is a proactive rather than reactive request. So let's save the future with Akbar which sort of sounds like this great superhero film, so I'm thrilled to be a part of this. So let's save the future, and we're doing that by getting you prepared for a PhD program. And you've often heard me say that I can tell if a student is going to complete a PhD successfully in three years if they work hard in the first year. If their first year is successful, they're going to get home. But I'm actually going to enlarge on my argument there. Actually, the quick and successful PhD is often determined in the three months before a student enrols. So we're going to talk a little bit about this period before enrolment. So the audience for today's Outrider is obviously our wonderful students about to start. We are thrilled. Welcome to your journey. I hope it's a fantastic one. So we're getting you sort of organised to set you up for success. Terrific. But there's also a second group that is a very large group and important group. This is a group where something's happened. They've gone on a leave of absence, they've suspended from their studies, they've gone part-time, full-time, full-time, part-time, or indeed they, I won't use the word fail, but they left a PhD program, they are treated from a PhD program, and they've decided to go again, and they want to understand what went wrong and what they can do to make it right. That's an important group, and I see you and I hear you, it's a very large group, let's do this for you. So what I'm trying to do today is configure a moment where we can regroup, we can be honest and we can construct a framework of success. That's what I want for you. So today has a diagnostic purpose. We're back to Tara's 10 tips to get you organised for success in a PhD program. Now the reading this week, there's some, you know, so many, there's like thousands thousands of blogs and sort of journalistic articles about wow that's successful so once more a data point of one we love our data points of one not but I've looked very strongly also at the refereed literature also university websites what they recommend to their students to be successful but I have focused on the refereed literature particularly after COVID because our universities are different now. And to be frank with you, as someone who's been a dean through much of this period, uh, our PhD programs are very different now. And that's not always a good thing, can I say. We may do a later outrider on that. So let's get to Tara's 10 tip. Tip number one. Let's build relationships. Preparing for a PhD first requires that you organise your relationships. Now, the first and most important relationship is with your supervisor. Now, at CDU, we have a supervisory charter. I'll provide a link to a document for you so you can use it at your leisure. Now, what the charter does is it provides a framework for what would be quite uncomfortable conversations about relationships and bridges and boundaries and how this relationship is going to occur through the supervision okay so it provides a scaffold for a, a difficult conversation so you need to ask your supervisor how they can figure success how they think about feedback and most importantly right at the start what is effective communication for you both because if your supervisor has this notion that they're able to phone you at any point or text you at any point like you are a drug dealer and that's not exactly how you want to communicate you need to speak those words so we need to be very clear now between a student and a supervisor and we have to agree on the platforms for communication and you also need to start building your relationships with your future colleagues. That might be the crew in the lab, the crew you're going to go on field work with. But if you're an individual researcher, like a lot of our disciplines, then don't fret about that. Most universities have a series of social, more informal 
groups that exist alongside your candidature. So for example, at CDU we have digital office hours and Right Club, we open them up for the world. So wherever you are, if you're thinking of getting into a PhD program, you can just sort of sit in that space, you can communicate, you can ask questions, you can answer, but it's a way to socialise you into a doctoral space. And most universities these days have, and I'll use the cliche, but it is important, safe spaces for students to ask questions, to provide answers, and get yourself comfortable with the informal learning, the meta-learning that is part of doing research. Look up also, this is crucial, research seminars that your university or other universities are running. This is the gift in many ways of COVID because whenever we run a seminar these days, we also happen to record it and we often load it up into what is the university's YouTube channel. We do that at CDU. We do that for our current students who maybe have caring responsibilities or are in full-time work, and they can look at that seminar at their leisure. The gift for you as a prospective student is all this incredible material exists for, list, for you to listen to and watch at your leisure. So again, to just orient yourself into the languages, the ontologies of doctoral education. But then, of course, there are also your personal relationships. You've got to get organised. Your relationship with your partner, with your parents, with your kids, with your friends. These have to be organised as early as possible. You've heard me say so often it takes a village to graduate a PhD student. I still agree with myself. But can I say it also takes some very robust conversations at the start to ensure that you begin with the end in mind. You begin with success. If your partner, <laughs> if your partner doesn't like the idea of you doing a PhD, you are not going to do a PhD. So have these robust conversations at the start. Two, yeah, think about your working environment. Your university may allocate you a working environment, so a shared office for example, and you need to think about how am I going to set up this space. But also, if it is a shared office, again, you've got to have these very honest conversations with the people that you're sharing your office with, right? We all know what happens often if someone likes really quiet working time. The way synergy works is they're paired with someone who loves to talk, bring in people into the office, talking, coffee, etc. So there's got to be an agreement between all members of the office about how the work will be conducted. Remember, if you're in a work environment, you're in a group environment, you've got to express, you've got to communicate your needs rather than just sort of seethe with anger. At the start, say, right, how are we going to organise this space? How are we going to respect each other's way of doing research? Say the questions that overtly. Now, it's great if you have the opportunity for a home office, even if it is simply your kitchen table. Now, as you might see, my work office at CDU is very much a consulting office. I don't do any research there. I don't write reports there. It's not a writing or a, a research office, really. I just see people in that office. And sadly, I can't video stuff there. You don't very rarely see me videoing in the office because it's on a corridor and it's quite loud. So it just means that office has particular functions and I need another space to do like the actual work. And so, you know, as most of you know, I've been living in temporary accommodation for two and a half years now. <laughs> All my staff is in storage. I'm living out of two suitcases. So what I would say to you as an old person who's been doing research, being an academic for 30 years, if I'd waited for the perfect research space in those 30 years, I would never have produced a book or an article. I have managed, and I'm proud of myself for doing this, I have managed to create research, develop research in dreadful, unstable, difficult environments. So what I'd say to you is do feel confident in, okay, so you're in temporary accommodation, you're setting your computer, computer up on a dining room table, do that. That's how I've done the bulk of my research, just get organised. And look, right at the moment, as you can see, I've got a desk, I've got a chair, I've got a computer, and that's it. And that's my research life and career. So try and think about your best working environment or indeed how you can make the best of the situation that you're in. You must organise your life to write, 
You must organise your life to create research. And this is where you do this reflexive work before you have enrolled, you get yourself organised. Now, three, read early, read often, read. I judge students, hell, I judge people, <laughs> uh, by their reading behaviours. I do, I'm sorry, but wow, I do, I do. You need to have a really good sense of the research in your area. How are you going to determine the research gap? How are you going to determine your SOC, your significant original contribution to knowledge, if you haven't actually read the field? So get books, get articles on methodology, get really, really recent stuff, that's incredibly important. Get those Google Scholar alerts working for you. Work out your 10 most important scholars, get Google alerts on them, work out your 10 most important concepts or tropes, hello, Get Google Scholar alerts on them. You see, we learn to read by reading. We gain a vocabulary and most importantly, we learn the shape of debates. We can start to learn to follow an argument and then of course we can develop our own. So get in the habit of reading every day, please. Read every day. It's such a blessing it's such a privilege to read the words of other people. Because what reading does is it challenges our ideas. It challenges our ideas in the culture. It's evidence. So if we've got opinion or vibe, let me tell you what I'm feeling. Not too bothered what you're feeling. Evidence. This is research. Reading is a gift that we give ourselves every single day. The difference between the students who succeed and the students who fail is the calibre, the scope and scale of their reading. Full stop. Four, write early, write often, write. Very few things frighten me more in a doctoral program than when a student says, all I've got to do is write up. This is the equivalent of saying, you know what, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk to the moon. Ah, yeah. Great. That's not how you do it. Write early, write often, write constantly, write, write, write. Before you get started, get in the habit of writing every single day. You may start with, you know, writing your motivations, what drew you to a PhD program, that's fine, just getting into the vibe of writing. But you need to quite quickly start moving to writing about the interpretations of the research that you are enacting. Now, you may decide to write a blog through a PhD, millions of students around the world have, and the research does show, colleagues, to be frank, the students who have a journal or a blog through the PhD, have a greater chance of being successful. And that's been studied, particularly in the Scandinavian countries. The reason those students tend to be successful is they're reflecting on the PhD while they're doing it. Now, I'm not a great journal writer, to be honest with you, but there's no doubt that writing about your reading is incredibly productive. So what I do, for example, is I take very, very good notes from what I read every day, but then when I finish a book in particular, I go to Goodreads, Goodreads, which is a great little site, and I write a sort of summary and view and vibe on what I've just read. So I've done a meta interpretation of the note taking and the research that I've read, holds me accountable, gives it a short review, lets me go a bit meta. It also keeps you honest too. So the great thing about blogs and journaling and even Goodreads is you've got accountability to the reading that you've enacted. Five, Information literacy and academic literacy are the foundations of a successful PhD program. Reading and writing skills are crucial. And we have to learn them. We are not born, we don't come out of the vagina. Reading and writing, I wish we did, but we have to learn how to do it. But academic literacy, information literacy, can save us so much time. And yet we talk about it so rarely. I think it was Linhart who described information literacy as the, quote, neglected essential skill, end of quote, brilliant. 
Now, I recommend that every single student about to go into a PhD program enrol in an information literacy course. Seriously, enrol in an information literacy course. There are some great MOOCs on information literacy, and I checked last week, edX is currently listing 45 courses on information literacy from amazing universities all around the world. Do one of them. But also visit your institutional library page. Often they have a YouTube site as well these days and see the information literacy programs that are available from your librarians. Librarians can save you months, hell, years in your PhD. Learn about databases, learn about software, learn about interfaces. And most importantly, spend quality time in Google Scholar. Google Scholar, in my life, has saved me tens of thousands of hours. It allows me, with precision and with speed, to locate outstanding research from around the world. Not located in Europe and North America, although respect to my colleagues in Europe and North America, but Google Scholar allows me to enact properly international research from some of the greatest scholars around the world who don't happen to live in North America or in Europe. It is remarkable to me that we still have students that don't know how to use Google Scholar. So about once every two days, I have a student come into my office and say, oh Tara, there's no literature on my field. I sit them down, we go to my computer, we go to Google Scholar, I say, right, and of course I've just met them, right, so I don't know their research field. I said, right, give me three key scholars in your field and five terms, five concepts. Click, 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 click. Click the research published since 2020. And there's 45,000 refereed articles. So supposedly from a field where there's nothing, there it is, okay? What happens, what I think is holding students back from using Google Scholar well, is a strong vocabulary and knowing the key scholars in the field. And if you can just enhance your vocabulary, your tropes a bit more, and get the, get the big names, get the names, 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 that will help you enormously in Google Scholar. Therefore, Enact the profound expertise from your librarians, learn about databases, learn about Google Scholar. Six, start with the end in mind, read completed PhDs. Now the PhD is a very unusual form of assessment, okay? It's probably one of the only times in your life, and I'm trying to think of others, but it's probably one of the only, except the Olympics, the only time in your life where one object is being assessed and that object is examined by people that you don't know that are not too bothered about what happens here they're interested in the caliber of your research so what I would advise and it will change your life is please before you start a PhD read a completed PhD seriously read lots of them find your discipline go to Google Scholar and read completed PhDs. Sit down, read it, and that's how you learn how a PhD is structured and the diversity of ways in which a PhD is structured. But also, go to your university, in our case, CDU, go to our university and look at the policies and procedures for higher degree examination. They are sitting there for you to read. That is what is going to be sent to your examiners. So why wouldn't you at the start of your doctorate have a look at the policies and procedures that are going to configure the examination of it? It's there, it's public, read it. Look at how a PhD is examined and what that does is that brings so much more information back to your control. Make sure you understand what is examined, what is this object, what does the thesis look like? What does the examiner read? And then please talk about examination with people like me, deans, our research examination officers. We love, we love talking about examination. It's my favourite topic in the universe. So ask us and we will love to talk about that with you. So don't sit and wonder, oh, I wonder what's happening. Ask us. We're excited about examination. Okay, seven. Develop your expertise in teaching and learning. I know this seems a weird one. Let me tell you why we're here. 
There's no doubt that casual teaching budgets in our universities are declining. In fact, our budgets in universities are declining. But it is important to learn how to teach and learn how you learn and learn how others learn. Because all of a sudden an opportunity will come up during the PhD where you'll have a chance to teach and you need to say yes to that opportunity. So you need to prepare yourself. And part of the preparation into a doctoral program is looking into some professional development in teaching. So you know, at its most basic, how to lecture, how to run a tutorial, how to run a seminar, how to do online learning management systems. Okay, all of that is important. And there are plenty of short courses on LinkedIn. There's some courses on academia.edu, tons of MOOCs. So come in to your doctoral program having just a little bit of teaching and learning expertise in your back pocket because you will use it. Eight, motivation matters. Motivation is the fuel of a successful PhD. Without motivation, you will not finish this degree, full stop. So write answers to the question, why am I doing this? Why am I doing a PhD? Get really good answers to that. Answering this question will allow you also to see the challenges that you may confront, the gaps in your understanding, your fears, your vulnerabilities, your worries. It'll also allow you to do a bit of a skills needs analysis. So this is what I'd like to do, but I can't do that yet. That knowledge is crucial. I get my students to fill in, as you know, their PhD setup document. I've got a wonderful student starting next week, and she's doing that work right now for our first meeting on Tuesday. So it's exciting. So she's taking a whole week filling in that PhD setup document, and we will talk about it in full in our first meeting. Because what that document does is it moves you forward from wanting to do a PhD to having the skills and abilities to actually enrol and succeed at it. Nine, time to open up an academic CV. Now, open up an academic CV. You may have a CV, you may have one of those dreadful resumes that people are doing at the moment. You have like a picture of you in the corner? And you know, your interests, you know, I like hockey and walking along the beach on Sunday mornings, you know, those sort of resumes. Well, that's over, girlfriend. This, <laughs> what is that about? What we're doing now is an academic CV. So this is the moment where you construct it and this is a living, breathing document that you are going to touch and open and enhance every single week. Now, I still, at my age, work on my CV every single Sunday morning. And that allows me to reflect, okay, what have I done this week? What have I not done this week? What skills would I like to develop? The CV is a, an accountability measure for my growth as a human and a scholar. So create new headings in your CV and work to flesh out those headings. And just to get you started, you might want headings like, for example, your qualifications, articles, book chapters, conferences, poster presentations, consultancy, professional development, community engagement. There's just a few headings. There's, there's hundreds of them you could choose. But just start and treat them as an aspirational heading and start to achieve things and get that sense of achievement that every Sunday morning you can add something to your CV. Ten, do the reflection work. I want you to write down four headings on a piece of paper for me. So I want a heading and then a gap, a heading and a gap four times. Here are the four headings for you. How do I like to give and receive feedback? What frightens me? What gives me confidence? And four, what saps? my confidence. Now I want you to sit with a cup of coffee with this bit or these pieces of paper and fill out the answers to those questions because what you're doing is you're enacting a really deep diagnostic of your life. We must not be so frightened that we can't understand our fears. We've got to feel the fear and do it anyway move through the fear to understand our fears. And if you don't do this work, 
you're unprepared for the PhD because this is a frightening experience. Working in international higher education at the moment is a truly daily frightening experience. I need you strong. I need you focused. I need you clear. So get yourself personally and professionally organized and prepared for this PhD. Now after you've answered those four questions, that is a great scaffold to your self-awareness, your self-actualization. And one other great way to do this is read the experience of other PhD students. So put in PhD student blogs into Google. I did that last week and there are 23 million returns. So it's plenty of material for you to read. Immerse yourself into the experience of others. Stop thinking about yourself as a data set of one real problem in doctoral education team. Start to read the experiences of others and learn from them. If there's any advice finally that I would offer you all is to recognize the difference. Recognize that a PhD is very, very different from any other degree you will do. And I've seen so many students have so many problems and leave the program if they just assume that a PhD is like a master's or a PhD is like an honours or I've done a capstone and I enjoyed it, therefore the PhD will be just like that. Wrong. Wrong. This degree is completely different from the other degrees that exist in our universities. It is regulated, it is governed very, very differently. So go into a PhD knowing that it is different and enjoy the differences, experience the differences, understand the differences. So Akbar, thank you so much for this suggestion. I loved writing this one and it has been amazing to get to know you in the last year or so. You take care mate and I wish you all love, light and peace. Tea out.